Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, Book of Mark. Now, as you know, Mark was never a disciple, but he was a young lad that was around Peter and the others because they gathered at his mother's house quite often. And he was aggressive in hearing and, and an actual eyewitness. And as youth is, he's vivacious. It moves. It rocks. So makes his gospel uh, exciting and complete from the eyes of uh, that youth. You see that different picture, not different, same picture, but emphasized by youth. It's exciting. Christ has just crossed over in a ship and still the seas, and he was teaching them what it would be like without him. It'd be a rough old ride. Life is like that. Without Christ, it's a rough old ride. The reason being, you always want Christ in your Christian boat, and you'll have a good trip. So we start a new chapter, chapter 5, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the um, Gadarenes. Verse 2, And when he was come out of the ship, immediately, instantly, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. This is the place of the dead. He was, he was out there. He was Satan-possessed. And um, uh, it would be, this man is going to be very important to this chapter and the events that transpire here. Verse 3, Who had his dwelling among the tombs, the place of the dead, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Now, I'm going to tell you something, and I want you to get this point real good. No earthly thing can bind Satan. But a simple word to our Father in Christ's name binds him. I want to say that one more time. No chains, no earthly thing can bind Satan. But one simple word to the Father in Christ's name can lock him in. That's all it takes. Let's see how Christ handles it. Verse 4, Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, just ripped him away, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Uh, again, I'll say it again, the, the point being, no earthly thing can chain or bind Satan. But just one simple loving word to Almighty God in the name of the Son can order him out. Verse 5, And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. He was possessed. Verse 6, But when he saw Jesus afar off, well, not up close, afar off even, he ran and worshipped him. This is a point even the demons, even the evil spirits know who Messiah is. Why? They had walked with him in the first earth age. They, they knew him. He was in the exact image as God would say, let us create man in our image. He included himself. That's what our means. And when he included himself, then... As Christ would say in John chapter 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. They look just alike. So naturally, these evil spirits knew exactly who he was. That's why they ran and they worshipped him. Why? Because whatever he decided, there were no fetters or anything going to bind them this time. They had to depend on this man, the Son of God, the only begotten. Verse 7, 
And they cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, Yeshua, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. In other words, leave us alone. They know, you see, evil spirits know that a man or a woman of God is going to send them back where they come from, and that's death to them, basically. And they, they were afraid Christ was going to send them back. That would have been the end of the road right there. So they're, they're begging him. Verse 8, what did Jesus do? For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Verse 9, And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion. You know, a legion is about 6,000 men in the Roman army. For we are many. And truly they were. He had a six pack. 6,000, that's Satan's number. So you got Satan written all over this, okay? And so that you make no mistake, and this would be a true lunar uh, deal going here, all right? Uh, verse 10, And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Don't send us away. They have to have a body to exist in. Warm, welcoming, uh, anybody they can take over. Okay, flesh. Got to have a home. Verse 11, Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. About 2,000 of them out there feeding along. Verse 12, And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter unto them. In other words, swine would be the lowest carnal flesh there is. And they're willing to go anywhere. An evil spirit is willing to go anywhere at the order of God, just let us go into them. Now, there's something going to happen here that you're, many people question. Christ is going to let them go into the swine, and the swine are going to drown themselves. And many people are going to question and say, why, why didn't God send them back? Where, why didn't Jesus send them back where they came from? There's a real good answer. Because he gives us the power and the authority to do it. He expects us to send them back where they came from in His name. That being the whole situation, okay? Uh, a little clue ahead of time. They, they, uh, they're willing to go into, into the hogs. Verse 13, And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. They drowned it dead in a hammer, every one of them, 2,000. Even the swine wouldn't put up with evil spirits. People will sometimes <clears throat> if they're possessed. But uh, this lets you know that Evil spirits are not particular. They'll go anywhere and wherever they can. And there's not, there's not one behind every bush, but bless your hearts, don't ever kid yourself. They are in this world. We have the Holy Spirit, but there is also evil spirits. And evil spirits always look for a home. That's why when you cleanse one uh, from a person, you want to always instill Christ within them or they'll come back and repossess that person all over sevenfold. The hogs drowned themselves. There went pork chops, I mean a bunch of them, right in the creek. All right, Verse 14, And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. I mean, they, they lost 2,000 head of stock. 15. And they came to Jesus, and they see him that was possessed with the devil, and had uh, the legion sitting and clothed. He had clothes on, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Now, what kind of people is this? 
that here this miracle has happened, and this one is sitting in his right mind, cleansed of the evil spirits from their community, in his right mind and clothed. And what are they? They're afraid. Do you, you, you understand why they're afraid? They lost 2,000 head of stock, okay? Pork chops right in the drink. 16. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And he, he put them in there and the whole bunch just ran in the river, the sea, and drowned. Verse 17, and they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. I mean, get rid of him. He's expensive. Look what he's cost us. This shows you what kind of people were living there. They could not appreciate the fact that a human being had been recovered, was now in his right mind, that they could do nothing with. No man could tame him. Christ can. The Holy Spirit can tame anyone. Earthly objects can never change Satan. One word from Christ, come out, and they're gone. That's all it takes. And, and naturally, that is the Holy Spirit that overpowers. Satan can never enter a house protected by the Lord Jesus Christ. But they're, they're wanting him out of there to go. Verse 9, verse 18. And uh, when he was come unto the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Let me go with you. I don't want to stay with these people. He's in his right mind now. I want you to see the miracle of Christ's hand. Do you know what he's going to do? He's going to take this one that was possessed and he's going to make a teacher out of him, a seed planter. He's going to make a Christian out of him. He's going to send him back to that bunch to teach. That's, that's the miracle of our Savior. That is the way in which he works. Now, I'm, I mean, this lad, he wants... He knows what Christ has done for him, and unlike the rest, he's appreciative. And he wants to go with him. Verse 19, Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, listen carefully, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. You go home and teach. You go home and share this good news. You go home and share the gospel. That's what good news is. So how, how precious it is that Christ would drag right from the very clutches of the devil this soul, this beautiful soul. I mean, recover it. Drive out the evil spirits and make a teacher out of him. Christ is, all things are possible with him. And again, the, the very base root of the teaching is this. Nothing earthly can control evil spirits. You can try all you want to. You can educate all you want to uh, aside from, from Christ. You can buy anything you want to buy. You can order anything you want to order. You can chain, lock up. Do whatever you want to, but nothing earthly will control evil spirits. Only a word, a loving word to Almighty God. In the name of Christ, they have to obey. That controls them. That simple, that easy, it is done. And Christ will use whomever he chooses. This time, he chose the very one that... Um, they so feared to teach and to share. Verse 20, And he departed, and he began to publish in Decapolis. This is Syria, and you, you must be aware of that, it, and, uh, and so it is, how, um, how great things Jesus had done for him 
and all men did marvel. Uh, Decapolis being uh, Syria and um, and we will, we, we, that's an important point that I will bring up again here in a moment. Aramaic, okay. Verse 21, and when Jesus was passed over again by ship into the other side, much people gathered with him, and he was nigh unto the sea. 22, and behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, uh, which is to say whom Yah enlightens by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. He worshiped him. He loved him. This shows what? It shows faith. You're going to learn in the remainder of this chapter how important faith is. Faith in what? Faith in he that can cut it. Faith in he that gets it done. Faith in he who is in charge. Faith in he who sits on the throne at the right hand of our Heavenly Father. Verse 23, And he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Now, this is a little 12-year-old girl, and number 12 is the reason we're here. Christ has come to drive Satan from the very midst of the 12 tribes, that is to say, the, the, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And there's only one thing that will heal them, and there's only one thing that will give them eternal life, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And this one who was enlightened by God, Jairus, knows that. Verse 24, And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. They know the miracles. They saw them. They were encouraged by them. 25, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. And, and here we have uh, not only life, but here we have sickness. 12 years, again, for the 12 tribes. In other words, Christ gives eternal life, and it is He that can heal when man fails. Well, how do you know man failed? 26, and had suffered many things of many physicians. They all tried and had spent all that she had, took every penny and then some, and was nothing better. They didn't help her one iota, but rather grew worse. If anything, it got worse. Again, here, here is only when it comes to the 12 tribes, when it comes to the children of Israel, when it comes to God's children, only He can give eternal life and only He can truly heal. The, the very soul itself, your very spirit. 27, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. Now, that, that's faith, beloved. She knew if I can just touch him, I'll be healed. I mean, here she had tried every doctor in the community, spent every dime she had. She hadn't had any results. It got worse, if anything. But she had this. She knew if she could just touch him, because of well, how would she know that? Because of the miracles he had performed, it was public. Everybody knew that if she could touch him, that she'd be healed. That's faith. Faith is so important. Let me tell you something. You can work all you want to, but if you don't have faith, it's dead. You have to believe in our Father and know of His love, His understanding, His compassion, His leadership, His blessings, His touch. 28, for she said, if I may touch but His clothes, I will be whole. Boy, what faith, awesome. 29, and straightway, immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Christ can do it. Only Christ can take those 12 and provide what it is they need. And that's, that's why this number 12 is utilized twice in this chapter concerning giving life and healing. 
Only he can do it, spiritually speaking. Verse 30, And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? Question. Verse 31, And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? You're asking us who, and they're all grouping, groping for you? 32, and he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. Christ knew who it was, and he looked upon her. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. I mean, she admitted it. It was I. And she was worshiping him for the fact that she was healed, and that love pouring forth and his pouring back to her. He knew who it was. Verse 34, And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith. Do you want me to say that again? It's something you really need to hang on to. Daughter, thy faith. Faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. That's the way our Savior operates, beloved. Talk to Him, but talk to Him with faith and in faith about your faith and be, be blessed. Be blessed because He loves you he loves to hear from you, and so it is. Verse 35, While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, The daughter's dead. She's gone. Why troublest thou the master any further? She's, she, she's gone. She died. 36, As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. You see how important that is? That's what this lesson is about. Only believe. That makes the difference of night and day. That makes the difference of salvation and, and um, failure. Is believing. Believing is knowing. There is no such thing as having a little bit of belief, don't give me that. You either believe or you don't, period. End of story. And to believe is, you see, Christianity is not a religion, it's, it's reality. It's the real thing. You can believe. What you do in Christianity is look at facts. Look at facts of who has that peace of mind, who has that security, who does God sustain? Who does God raise up? Who does God bless? Those that believe. Our Father uses those that picture and bring forth faith. It's faith in Him. You know, many people um, that um, want to be, what, what they really want is for their family to have faith in them. Faith is, is an awesome thing. Well, we're family, and God wants you to have faith in Him, period. Verse 37, And He suffered no man to follow Him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. These three that He knew had faith. When, when you're asking a healing, don't ever let somebody hang on around that's a non-believer. Get rid of them. Move them back out of the way. Only have with you to, to complete the healing those that have faith and those that believe. Don't mess with anyone else. Verse 38, and I'm talking about in, in healing someone or, or praying in earnest to Almighty God. 38, and he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult. Oh, there they're weeping, they're beating their breast as they would, would publicly, and them that wept and wailed greatly. <clears throat> 39. And when he was come in, he said unto them, 
why make you this ado? And weep. The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Oh, and listen, they've already, you know, they even hired whalers at certain funerals, okay, to put on a, a big show. And you know what they do to him when he says, she's, she's sleeping, verse 40. This is what they did, 40. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, get rid of them. Put them all out. He taketh the father and the mother of the damsel. He could take them because they're the ones that sent for him. They had bait bring them in, they've got faith, hang on to them. And them that were with him entered in and entered in where the damsel was laying. And um, what do we have here? We, we have five and Christ. Five is symbolic of grace. And of course, Christ is always present when grace is deserved and, and loved. Uh, and he, he's got a crew here that he knows has faith in him and in the Father to know we can, we can cut it. And the point is, is in him, it is good to have life in the flesh, but it is better to have life eternal, for that is forever, ever, ever with our Father. And he is the one, if you have faith, that brings forth that eternal life as well as a good life in the flesh. What happened then? Verse 41, And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. So, Tabitha, his damsel, Gumai, rise up. Uh, and this word, well, why, why is it in a different language? Because they were in Syria. This is Aramaic. And, and he speaks it in Aramaic because that was the language of the daughter. And she could hear and understand. Verse 42, and straightway, that's immediately, little, little old uh, Mark, uh, that uh, 26 times he uses this term, straightway, immediately, or a noun. It means quickly. The damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. I mean, they, they were celebrating her death, beating their breast, uh, which, is, which is custom at a funeral here in this, uh, a passing. And <clears throat> here, she's walking around. She's alive. Well, how could this be? Because the life giver was present. Because faith made her whole. Faith completed the cycle. Faith healed the one 12 years, symbolic of the 12 of God's children, of disease and whatever my infirmament. And then in the damsel, 12 years old being that he could give her life eternal as well as good life. And, and when he touched her, he gave the example of common sense. He spoke in a language she could understand where she was at peace. And he spoke in such a way that there were no non-believers present. And you need, to, you need to know this. But only those that had faith in him, in our Father, to know that he could cut it, he could get it done. Well, well, how could they be so sure? They had witnessed it over and over and over again. You know, it doesn't take a, a, a person that is, um, uh, is, uh, has acquired common sense 
and you're born with it, knows our Heavenly Father and what He can arrange and do. And, and with common sense, you look at facts. You don't judge by what this man says or that man says. You go by facts, Is, be it true or not. The facts were that he had touched and healed and freed. He had, re had raised the dead, basically, so to speak. And, and people thronged him because they had witnessed and seen this. They didn't necessarily believe in his doctrine, but they believed in his miracles. They were astonished at these things. Now, what's he going to do? What is he going to do concerning this 12-year-old damsel? He has raised her back to dead, from the dead, so to speak. Though she was not, she was asleep. This was to prove a point of teaching. Let us see what he did. Verse 43. And he charged them straightly, that means strictly, that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. What is important that you make a note of Luke chapter 8, verse 55, for what he said is give her meat. Do not give her milk. Do not give her mush. Do not give her a little truth. Give her meat of truth that will stick to her ribs and make a decent woman of Israel out of her, a follow of the Lord Jesus Christ. Meat means the truth from God's Word, not a bunch of pablum, uh, um, insufficient man's traditions, but give her meat. That's what it takes. That's what true teaching is, is bringing forth the meat of God's Word. What a chapter, this fifth chapter. Five means grace, and boy, you can receive grace from that chapter. You learn a lot from it. Earthly things can't bind Satan. Christ can. One word. And infirmities in life for those that have faith. When you partake of the meat, is there for all. Why? Because he loves you. All right, bless your hearts. Uh, listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. Hey, that number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. The Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We do not judge people. Do you know why? We've got one judge and he doesn't need our help. He's capable. Our father is the judge and one of the biggest sins you can do is start judging people. You have the right and the prerogative to discern who you should hear, who you should listen to, and so forth, but leave the judging up to our Father. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Got a prayer request? You don't need that number. We can do away with it. You don't need an address. God knows what you're thinking right now. You don't even have to say it out loud. He's got time for you. You're his child. Your DNA is different than anyone else's. Your fingerprints are. You're unique. He created you just the way he wanted you. 
but he does want you to love him. That pays great dividends. Let him know that, won't you? Let's go to his throne. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, Jason from California. <clears throat> Is it true that a Memzar cannot be saved or are they condemned forever? Absolutely not. It's just all it says in uh, Deuteronomy uh, that they can't take part in the kingship. Uh, let, let, me, let me tell you something. God, in creating souls, never, ever, ever created a soul that is a memzar. It is man that creates memzars by not following God's law of kind after kind. And certainly, I'll say it again, in spiritual bodies, there are no mamzars. That, that's plowing a little deep for you, but I just will lay that on you for thought. But all the scripture declares is they cannot take part in the kingdom. That's to say in the king and his dominion. Why? Because in their way, they have their own kingdom. But they certainly... Uh, if you've been a Christian, you know that God so get, loved His only begotten Son, that he, he loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whomsoever would believe upon Him, have faith in Him, should not perish but have eternal life. Even the Memzars are included in that. God created their souls pure. It is men that crossed them. Glinda from Louisiana, please explain the verse, The dead in Christ shall rise uh, first. Well, it's real simple. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And if some, you're still here, but your relatives that have passed on have risen first. Why? Because if you're absent from this body, you're present with the Lord, they're already gone. They've already risen. The flesh goes back to dust from which it came. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. But the spirit, the intellect of your soul and your spiritual body instantly goes back to the Father that gave it. Uh, it is amazing to me that pe some people with misunderstanding 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, they expect the graves to open and people to come out when they, they left already. They're not here. And, and I know from military service and, and so forth from World War II and the Korean War that, uh, well, I won't go into that, but bodies go back to dirt, okay? And that's good because it's not our real body. Our real body is the flesh body anyway. Mark, that's your eternal body. You better get used to it. Mark from Colorado. Pastor, please clarify where we will be spending eternity. Will it be on earth? God's Word declares very clearly in, in, Matthew, in Revelation chapter 21 that God's kingdom, His throne, His altar is right here on good old earth. But the earth is rejuvenated back to its original form and being, meaning the firmament goes back where it belongs and, um, and, and so it is that this earth is protected. There will be no jet streams or storms or anything. The earth will be watered each night. It's a fantastic place until Satan brought about the catabole, the overthrow. And then we've kind of had some bad storms since then. But the storms will be over as it is written in, in Revelation chapter 21. Michael from Minnesota. All the sins that were committed in the first earth age, what happened to them? Were they just forgotten? Absolutely not. What you did in the first earth age depend, uh, uh, demands and is what you are born into here. Okay? And, and so it is. Naturally, let's take, let's take God's elect. He states in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, that uh, very clearly that I chose you before the foundations of this earth age. Well, when was that? Well, it was in the first earth age. He chose his election there. Why? Because they fought Satan then. They stood against Satan there. 
and earn the right. That's why God can take his elect and know that when the false Messiah appears on this earth, they're going to stand against him again. He, he works with tried and true material. He knows they're fighters, spiritually speaking. He knows they'll stand against. He knows he can count on them because they have faith. Uh, Kelly from Arizona, I have heard that Esau gave his birthright to his brother. I was under the impression it was taken from him. Please explain this. Well, you're a little confused. In the first place, it wasn't taken from him. He sold it. He, he not only sold it, but he sold it for a bowl of mush. Okay, that, that's, that's all it took. He, he, he cared more about his tummy than he, he did uh, the, the blessing that God had for him. And then when he tried to back out of that and claim it, then God allowed his brother to use a little covert activity. God, God approves covert action, especially if it's against our enemies, against the enemies of God. Covert action is just fine. God recommended it in Jacob uh, taking the birthright when Esau, after having sold it, tried to take it or steal it again. Sharon from Missouri, Shannon rather, I think, I understand you to say that we will be able to identify the Antichrist because when he is here, we will be in our physical flesh bodies, and when the true Christ is here, we will be in our spiritual bodies. Is this correct? Yes, that is correct. But you will know first why. In the sixth trump, Satan comes. Christ doesn't return until the seventh trump. That's why we have the book of Revelation and, and we will still be in flesh bodies, but he's come, his message is, I've come to rapture you away. And, and let's try to save as many of your good friends and relatives as we can. And people are gonna say, oh yes, uh, and they'll call, him, they'll call him Lord. We'll, my brother out here or my sister thinks you're the devil. Well, bring them on in and let's talk to them. In other words, your own family turns you in to him, but that's good because that's the way the message gets taught, and, um, and uh, so it is. Uh, and Okay, let's see. I would like, to, I about thought I'd covered this, but Henry from Texas. I would like to know why God doesn't just destroy Satan. He's all-powerful, almighty. Why can't he destroy Satan and get rid of him? Well, because we have to have, uh, look around you today at the people. You, you want them with you for an eternity? I mean, look them over good. What chance do you think heaven would have with the people on earth in their present frames of mind? What kind of heaven do you think we would have if they were all there? You see, Satan... God is using him to test his people. God sent a letter. I mean, it's real simple and it's plain, telling us how to avoid the pitfalls, how to handle Satan, how to have eternal life, and over and over how much he loves us. And certainly, if you don't care to, if, if you don't care enough about God to take his letter of love that he's written you and live it as best you can, none of us are perfect, but you'd rather go with Satan. He wants to destroy the whole bunch so we don't have to put, him up, put up with them forever in heaven. It's a thing of love. God cannot force anyone to love him. He has to let Satan prove who loves God and who loves Satan. Those that love Satan will go with him and those that love God will go with us, go with our Father. That's what it's all about and that's why he won't destroy him right now. But when, it, when he's through with him, he's, his sentence is already passed. It was passed in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19 and it is fulfilled in the last, two, three verse, last four verses of Revelation chapter 20. Christopher from South Carolina, I'm looking for the scripture where Jesus ascends into heaven 
and goes to hell where he preaches to those from the Old Testament, giving them the opportunity to go to heaven with him. Can you tell me where this is at? I sure can. It's 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. He goes all the way back to the time of Noah, our father does, and gives them the opportunity to accept salvation. It would have been very unfair for Christ to have paid the price on the cross, and then only the people that lived after that have the privilege of salvation. No, our Father is fair to everyone. He allowed Christ to go to paradise, teach what had happened, and allowed many of them. If you read on in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, you find out many of those captives were freed. They accepted Him. They went with Him. And, and obtain that salvation. Jenny from Florida, at the seventh trump, when we who are, will, are still in flesh bodies change into spiritual bodies, be joined here on earth by those who are in paradise now, and will we go through the thousand years as, if, as one of God's elect? Yes, or one sent to teach, or one that is sent to be taught, will be here through the Lord's day, which is a thousand years. Rhonda from Florida, I read in the first. I, I read in First Peter chapter three verse twenty. Now that's ironic. I just mentioned this verse, that only eight people in all were saved from the flood. Who were those eight people, and how did we get so many races? It said there were eight Adamic people saved. Okay, there were other people on the ark. God said in Genesis chapter six, take two of every flesh all the races that were created on the sixth day, and God looked and it was good, they, they were on that ark. But there were only eight Adamic people, Adam, that is to say people through the, whom Christ would come. Judy from North Carolina, please document in the Bible where God recognizes only the church of Smyrna and Philadelphia. It isn't that he recognizes all seven of them. But I think what you mean is Church uh, Smyrna and Philadelphia are the only two churches he found nothing wrong with. So naturally, if there are seven churches and you know two of them that he found nothing wrong with and it tells you what they taught or are teaching, then certainly you want to go to a church that teaches uh, what those two churches taught. Your documentation is Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And uh, your, the meat of it is in 2.10 and 3.10, Revelation. But uh, what was it that Smyrna and Philadelphia taught? They taught who those were that claimed to be our brother Judah, but were of the synagogue of Satan, which is to say Kenites. If you're attending a church that doesn't teach who the Kenites are, you're in a heap of hurt. That's where your documentation is. Donna from Kentucky. What is the only unforgivable sin? The only unforgivable sin is for one of God's elect, as it is written in Luke chapter 12, verse 10, to refuse the Holy Spirit from speaking through them when they're delivered up before the Antichrist. Do I think that's going to happen? Absolutely not. There is no way it's going to happen. But if they, if they should, it would be unforgivable. Judy from Pennsylvania, can the devil mess with your prayers? Can he stop the Lord from answering your prayers? Absolutely not, unless you let him. I think today's lecture probably should have helped you with that, is that in his name, nothing, nothing on earth can bind Satan, but all you have to do is ask the Lord. But, <clears throat> but the devil cannot go where Christ is. If you, unless you let him, you can always let him, you can always invite him in. You know, there is such a thing as you can have a real nice home, and if you invite someone into your home that's carrying a six pack of evil spirits, you ask them in. You absolutely invited them into your home. And then you're wondering what happened. You, Christians must be real sharp. It, it, it is not a thing of being super intelligent. It's simply a thing of us, utilizing common sense. This is why you anoint your home, 
your family, and order anything ever from coming in piggyback and or otherwise into your home. You cleanse it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Regina from Illinois, do you have to, do you have to pay for God to bless you? Absolutely not. You cannot buy a blessing. You buy a blessing because you deserve it. You earn it. You, you, you do, God brings blessings to those He loves. He loves those that love Him. It's that simple. Money has absolutely nothing to do with it. Can, then can money bring a blessing? Those that support God's work naturally are blessed. But that does not, I repeat, does not in any way buy salvation. Christ paid an awesome price already on the cross that salvation is free to anyone who will partake of it. But he paid an awesome price for it. But it is free to you to receive it and to take it. You cannot buy it. Ken from Arkansas, the fallen angels that followed Satan do some of them or all of them come through Eve? Absolutely not. You see, angels are not born of woman. And fallen angels, that is an angel that is not in flesh body, but falls from heaven. Okay. They, they, they leave their place of habitation and come here. That's why they're called Nephilim. And... Um, uh, that's why they are called fallen angels, because they left their first place of habitation. Uh, th uh, I think you're thinking about Kenites, which is to say the sons of Cain. They were not fallen angels. They were simply sons of Cain. And we know who their father was. Christ teaches it in, in the 13th chapter of Matthew, beginning with verse 35. Linda from Michigan did the devil ever walk on the earth? Job chapter 1, verse 7. The angels and the children of God came before the throne of God. <clears throat> and God asked Satan, Where have you been? And Satan very plainly states in the sixth verse of Job chapter 1, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. And, uh, and, and spiritually, he can still do that. Uh, Mike, M Michael from Georgia, can you be saved by money? My wife is telling me you can, and I'm telling you to explain to her. I'm trying to explain to her that no, you can't. I, I don't know really. I, I hope somebody's not teaching this, but usually when I get two questions on the same subject, it usually means some preacher is teaching this somewhere, and that is false teaching. You cannot buy salvation. It is, it is a, a, almost blasphemy because Christ died on the cross to make salvation available to whomsoever will. And for someone to say that and belittle the sacrifice he paid on that cross and say money can buy it, is you're, you're knocking on the door of deep trouble. You cannot buy salvation, and you cannot buy God's love. You have to earn it. You have to earn it by telling Him you love Him and follow Him. But thank goodness. You know, again, I will say, though, Christ, in having paid that price, it was an awesome price He paid. He was crucified. And it's free. Um... Erwin from, I don't know where Erwin is from. What is the best way to tell people that there will not be a rapture and to be able to get them to understand? Thank you. Well, if, if God sent the spirit of slumber upon them, as Romans 11 will declare, you're not, if God can't do it, you're sure not going to. Okay. It's, and there are some people that do not have the courage to stand against Satan anyway. And it is kind of a cloak of innocency for them. They don't have enough brass horns to stand against, I mean, to really face the battle. But then those would be taught in the millennium. But um, 
naturally, you need to really, if you're going to teach the fact that there is no rapture, order my work on the rapture and you will learn more about it probably than you ever wanted to know. And um, um, you'll see it on the tape list here from the chapel. And it will take you through the Word of God, documenting. I mean, the word of rapture, the word rapture is not even in the Bible. Okay, it's not in the manuscripts, not in the King James version. You will have some say, "Well, it was in the Latin." Well, it was placed there. It doesn't exist. Okay, and and so it is. But anyway, if you're going to do it, you need to be well informed, and and you need biblically speaking, but. Don't, don't just plant a seed and if God wants it to grow, he'll cause it to grow. But if you want to teach, then you need to be prepared. Uh, Orlean from Nevada. Is someone, if someone doesn't accept Jesus before they die, do they still go up to heaven? Where can I find this in the Bible? Thank you. They go to paradise. But they may go on the wrong side of paradise. There is a gulf in between. You can read in Luke chapter 16 the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, and you will see that the rich man didn't make it. He's on the opposite side. Luke 16 will help you, and I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. It makes His day when you open the letter that He sent you. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. It's precious. You let him know you love him and stay in his word. We, we are brought to you by your tithes and your offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, when you bless God, he will always, you can count on it, he will always bless you. Now, most important is this. Christ is the living word. Therefore, you stay in his word. Every day in His Word is a good day. You know why? It's just like I said, Yeshua, Jesus, is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.